on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program Professor of History at Vanderbilt University, Jane Landers. Uh, Jane, welcome to the program. Thanks so much, Sam. Uh, so let's uh, let's start with the uh, just w where we're at now. Um, uh, the the president has basically begun the process of normalizing relations. The embargo, of course, is uh, statutory uh, and uh, can only be changed by uh, Congress. But but just give us a brief uh, a sense of, of of how big of a deal this is. Well, you know, it's huge. It's been long overdue in a lot of people's opinion, including mine. Uh, it really hasn't functioned, as many people have already pointed out. The many times I've been to Cuba, the people who are connected somehow to the government are not really uh, withdrawn as much from the economy as others. And when I go out into the countryside, you can see the vast difference in living standards um, in Havana and in the country. So embargo works against the very most vulnerable people uh, who are not related to officialdom. And I, I just don't think it works. And there's all sorts of goods to be had. Uh, things come in all the time from other places. And well, so that's the really thing that people function. forget, I think, is that uh, it's, just, it's just the U.S. That's right. That's right. Um, you know, for a long time, Spain has been heavily involved in building hotels for the tourists from Europe and from Latin America and uh, helping in other ways as well with financial support. Venezuela used to be quite a big uh, assistance to Cuba when there was sufficient oil revenue and under Chavez that was quite the case. Uh, it was an exchange of medical knowledge and doctors from Cuba for the oil support from Venezuela and that also helped sustain a really uh, broken economy, and now uh, you know there's really not as much support except from tourism, and so it's just ev unevenly distributed as well. So I just really don't think the embargo is functioning. Now I want to I want to get to uh, a couple of points that I know that um, uh, you you have some specific expertise in, particularly the special time. Uh -huh. um, but um, but before we get there, I mean, isn't the point of I mean, I mean, in terms of the embargo, I mean, it's quite clear. I, I, if something's not working for 50-some-odd years, uh, right. there's no reason to believe that it's going to continue to work. And uh, there's obviously, uh, there's, there's, there seems to be multiple constituencies here who have a vested interest. We have things like agribusiness in this country who, and uh, probably, um, you know, uh, I don't know what you call them, tourism industries, who want to get into Cuba. Uh, there's uh, potential consumers there uh, for, for all sorts of our products. Uh, there's obviously the, uh, the Cuban people themselves, like you say, who have been uh, hurt by this embargo, you know, because the U.S. is obviously the biggest, uh, is the, the biggest sort of economic power, obviously, you know, within uh, miles uh, of them. Right, right. Uh, it also seems to me, and aside from sort of the individual, uh, uh, you, you know, we have sort of the older Cubans, people who had a vested interest, and I mean a dollar interest, in Cuba at the time of uh, the revolution of Castro's ascension, uh, the, it, it seems to me their theory all along, and I would include in this would be the, the, the corporations who have, uh, you know, several billions of dollars worth of claims in Cuba, uh, at right. least according to them, that they want a catastrophic failure of Cuba because that's the best chance for them to come in and have um, outside forces sort of dictate who gets, a, who, who gets uh, their claims reinstated. Is, is that basically the, the way it works? Well, I can't really speak for the corporate interests who have these plans, but I wouldn't doubt it. I, I just think there's got to be a better way to handle things, and the corporate interests are really not the ones that I'm the most concerned about, frankly. There were all sorts of uneven deals during the Batista years, as there were in all the dictatorships we supported around Latin America, where the privileged few got uh, benefits and, and were able to do startup companies and make wonderful profits exterior to Cuba, but uh, I'm not really so interested in, in their restoration of rights as much as having freedom of the press, uh, having freedom of movement, having internet connections for the people, and of course, to be able to sustain the 
the health conditions and education that are at least uh, one of the, or two, I guess should say, of the, uh, you know, the things that did work well in Cuba. <clears throat> Fortunately, we've lifted some restrictions on medicines and on food, and that's been a big help uh, to get people through things like, you know, the damage done by the special period. But uh, I know there are you know, people who lost private homes and so on as well, and I'd be more concerned about those. But uh, all in all, I think that's not the priority here. Uh, so let's talk about the the special period. I mean, I, I mean, I obviously I tend to agree with you, and I also, I mean, actually, before we get to the special period, you know, I mean, I think on um, uh, this audience. Uh, uh, certainly, I think is is primarily on the left, and in the main, there has been at different uh, times a um, I think uh, on the left a romanticizing of the the Castro uh, regime and era. And um, having visited once myself, I think I came back with a little bit more of a sober analysis of, of what, what year it's was like. it you visited, Sam? Uh, I was there in two thousand two. And okay. um, and so people were just, you know, we're still sort of talking about the special uh, period, but it, it mm-hmm. clearly ended. So yeah. uh, both give us a sense of like of through time, uh, through the the years of Castro, just sort of, you know, what was and what has been the life uh, for the average Cuban? What was the average Cuban sort of, I guess, perspective on, on these things? <laughs> Well, you know, the first time I actually went was uh, exactly when the special period began. I was there for a research project. Uh, it was under the Soviet uh, Union's control at that time, and I was handled by governor, government uh, drivers and, and so on. Um, everything was safe and secure because nobody dared do otherwise, and there was, as I said, an infusion of Soviet money and oil to help the economy, which was pretty much just tourism and sugar at that point. Uh, and as sugar collapsed on the economy, that wasn't helping either. But at least things were stable. There were, uh, you know, housing going up, uh, health care provided for everybody. Um, there were schools and so on. There were also committees for the defense of the revolution on every block where people were encouraged to spy and tell on others if they were doing something that the government didn't approve of and so on. And I wanted a, a socialist revolution to help, but it, it was corrupted almost from the beginning. And uh, so then we acted stupidly and not trying to get in on the ground floor and help Castro. Um, so problems on both sides blame on both sides, but the people are the ones that have have really suffered. And in that special period... Um, um, we, be, be, tell us when it was that first time that you were there and experienced those things, and then explain to us what the special period means. Okay. I'm sorry. I was there in 1991, and uh, the first time as a graduate student. And what followed after the collapse of the Soviet Union was that there was no more uh, foreign oil coming in, which had helped uh, sustain prices at low levels, which allowed uh, you know the rationing of food in equal measure and so on and after they pulled out, um, you know things got really bad, and there was no fuel, there was little food being brought in from the countryside because everything had been transformed into sugar uh, and I remember you know donkey carts bringing big you know, loads of bananas might be the only thing we'd eat in even the shabby tourist hotels where we were. Um, Water would be brought in in big tanks on trucks to be piped into really horrible water systems and decaying infrastructure uh, was pretty much a problem even then. Um, So it was very hard and people didn't have enough to eat. Um, The elderly, the weak, and the children, you know, are the most vulnerable in all those situations. And you may remember that there were even sort of vitamin deficiency blindnesses happening and so on. So the special period is a a very difficult one um, where people were just suffering. I was not able to get out into the countryside in that time period. Well, actually, I'm sorry, I was, I was actually, but I was under the drivers that were taking me and so on. So I didn't get to see anything but what they really wanted me to see. Later, I was able to, uh, you know, go out and do research projects that I have been running for all this time and uh, saw what was different about small towns uh, out in the countryside. The one I have visited over 20 years now is Ceiba Mocha, 
which used to be called San Agustin de la Nueva Florida, and it was a resettlement of Florida exiles to Cuba in 1762. So I've been working on that. And I was there most recently back again in May and uh, saw, you know, time is frozen there. There are Russian tractors still work in the fields, um, the old cars that everybody thinks are so romantic, but which are the only, you know, thing they've got going, a lot of donkey carts and mules and so on, still keeping people um, mobile up to a certain degree. So it's as if time froze in the countryside, and uh, and yet Havana was looking really pretty sparkly with new hotels and uh, some internet. Well, I, before I want to I want to I want to stay in the uh, the the special period for a moment because I mean this is one of the things that um, I think struck me when I was there is that uh, in this country. Um, you never the the implications of the fall of the Soviet Union uh, were all almost exclusively um, reported in the context of obviously the former Soviet Union and then um, the Eastern European countries. Right. And uh, at that time, I remember hearing nothing about what was happening in Cuba, but it 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 was just it they fell off a cliff basically, right? right? Right. Um, I mean, so just give us a little bit more of of just what it meant. I mean, how quickly that process happened, and how great was the deprivation, and also to what extent, if you have any sense of what it did to the national psyche, because the people I spoke to, they were it was it was just this massive betrayal of of it felt like a huge betrayal to them. I think, uh, and I'm well, curious as to your uh, your sense of that. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's very schizophrenic, as you probably saw. So you're surrounded all the time by walls painted with revolutionary slogans, by billboards that still look back to the heroes Che and Fidel and Camilo, and, uh, you know, the revolution will succeed and all of this and, you know, support for the patria. So all around there is everywhere you look, as you probably saw, are these exhortations to come to the defense of the revolution. Um, but behind the scenes, people, the normal people who are suffering because they can't get what they need or their families have been divided because others took the risks and went on the balsas, you know, the balsado people who floated to Miami, basically. Um, so fam families divided, uh, poverty, terrible housing, lack of infrastructure, all those things are are horrible to have to live with and to be assigned to live certain places to not be able to travel in your own country, go to your own beaches, take your own vacations wherever. So the people that were beginning to be critical, you may have seen that when they're talking in that way, they used to make a little motion where they stroked a, an invisible beard to, to poke fun at, at Fidel and the failures of the revolution. But it wasn't always a joke. There were, you know, there could be important consequences if you were too visible, uh, if you marched for some reason, if you tried to take a boat and escape across the bay from Regla, um, they sunk boats, they uh, imprisoned people. So the, the revolutionary fervor was good for those who were still being supported by the revolution, and the average people um, were much more critical, privately and quietly. Uh, uh, talk a little bit too about the, I guess, the foreign policy of Cuba. I mean, there there was uh, their involvement in places like Mozambique and Angola mm -hmm. and South mm -hmm. Africa, and how yeah. much of that was uh, enabled by their support. I mean, and I, you know, I've been. I think uh, it's quite clear when you look at like sort of the 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 special period and 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 what predated that, just how much support they were getting from uh, yeah. from the Soviet Union and how much that allowed them to do what they were doing. Right. They had. They would have had no way to do that otherwise. I mean, there was a tremendous investment. I'm more familiar with uh, what was going on in Angola, and I've actually talked to uh, people who came back from Angola who had been part of the revolution. One is a, a woman who was given a home right there on the on the um, main pathway to the sea uh, in Havana, and was given a home in which she opened a, a very wonderful paladar, a private restaurant, all around the walls are uh, the skulls of animals that she shot herself in Angola as a soldier, pictures of her uh, in, in combat uh, gear in Angola, and at some point she was actually wounded, brought back, 
uh, celebrated and then had to serve another term in Angola. So you still talk to people like that who, if they benefited from those adventures, are still loyal. But others lost their sons and we'll never know really how many people died in Angola. Uh, I don't really Tell know people, I mean, for, for listeners who may be too young to recall or uh, were not aware of just exactly what um, uh, Cuba did, what was their role in Angola and, and well, how did that come about? Castro, as soon as he had his revolution secured, and he thought it was secure, um, and many people were still rooting for him all along, um, they felt an ideological uh, responsibility to spread the system where they could. And so he took on the role of the leader of the third world. Uh, so there was a tremendous amount of press campaign uh, on his part. Uh, he would be received in these capitals and fed it and... Um, he really, I'm, I'm sure, seriously believed in all of it, and uh, so did many of the people that went and, and died there. Um, so as a responsible uh, leader of the third world, he thought the spread was up to him, and uh, so you had the adventures in Angola, Mozambique. You had Che going, eventually, supposedly renouncing his uh, role in Cuba so that none of the backlash would fall on Fidel when he went to Bolivia. Um, and... So the revolution was supposed to spread, but there was no way that Cuba on its own could have done that. Um, they didn't have the manufacturing capability at that point, and uh, they couldn't have supported it financially. So I think uh, a lot of that was, uh, again, support that could have gone to the Cuban people, and it was uh, spent outside, basically. Um, give me a sense, uh, too. Uh, so, uh, one thing that struck me when I was there was this disparity between the city and the country. And, uh, right, the, you saw it, too? Well, I mean, uh, to, to a certain extent. I mean, uh, we, we spent most of our time in and around Havana, but we went out to the country. But one of the things that I did understand was that uh, the vast majority of the people on the police force in Havana were from mm -hmm. the country. And mm -hmm. that this was this dynamic was exploited. Uh, just uh, give us a sense of like you know uh, of of what's behind that. And and as we see the normalization process take take hold, and assuming that we are at least maybe you know maybe a year, maybe two years, who knows, away from uh, the sort of the embargo beginning to sort of really finally crumble. What do we anticipate happening with that disparity and and just the country in general? Well, um, since you mentioned going out into the countryside and the connection of the police to the the mainstream, it's true there's always in the Latin world been a corporate um, entity for the civil and military police. Sometimes there are several different branches of police, military always ranking higher. In Cuba, you may have noticed the different colored uniforms, so they rank from just sort of low-level, you know, people helping the tourists across the street kind of people to the scarier guys in the black uniforms with heavy weaponry and that sort of thing. Um, but policing is one of the things that has a very long um, uh, corporate uh, sense to it in Latin America, and it is a way of building uh, loyalty to the state because those people at least have a regular salary, they're protected from civil courts, uh, the families can benefit in that way as well. So I think um, that's a pretty historic pattern, actually, all over Latin America. And military people are often the ones appointed to uh, all the state uh, jobs where there will be a salary, including places you wouldn't expect them, like historical institutes or uh, cultural institutes, where really they haven't the training for it. Um, but when you mentioned the, the countryside and attempting to get the loyalty in, we were talking a minute ago about the, the special period. During some of the trips there, when I did go to the countryside, there was absolutely no meat to be had. Uh, the government controlled uh, whether or not you could kill cows. There were no cats, as you may remember, or dogs in the street anymore. I've really noticed some improvement in uh, the last couple of years and more fields planted and more animals um, that I see out in the fields, too, uh, goats and some cows and some horses. Uh, so it looks like some things are improving in the countryside, but still not. What do you think accounts for that? I mean, is it, is it simply that technology has gotten better, that the countries in Central America 
um, have uh, become stronger economically, and so there's more opportunity. Uh, I mean, what 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 accounts for 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 the improvements? I mean, I guess this is all you know. Even though you know we're talking now fifteen or twenty years, I guess since yeah. the end of their d- full dependence on the Soviet Union and being cut off, I guess on some level, what we're seeing is the um, their ability to actually forge a new path. Well, uh, I think you know what has made the difference probably in these last couple of years is somehow the money from tourism coming into at least some state-run improvements out in the countryside. I noticed roads were better, walls were restored. Um, As I said, more planting and more animal husbandry. But um, when I mentioned it to the the people uh, of the small town where I was working, they said, oh, but that's right along the highway where the tourist buses are going to go that you'll see these kinds of things. So there's a certain amount of uh, theater (laughs) to some of the improvements uh, that still haven't, you know, helped the, the mainstream and the same people were still resorting to hunting for food and that sort of thing, even though I thought things looked a lot better. It's interesting because that's also, you know, uh, the, the Cuban regime has always had a, made a practice for the most part of giving people like artists and cultural figures much more leeway so that they could project out to... Um, to the rest of the world, that things might be a little bit freer and a little bit better than um, mm-hmm. than in home. What about uh, health and education? Uh, to the extent that w- we have perceptions that they have a uh, fairly, relatively speaking, robust health and education systems, h- how how real are those accomplishments? Well, you know, they certainly are. The training for medical personnel in Cuba was excellent, and. Um, Education became, you know, totally accessible for everybody. But even uh, in the early 90s when I was there uh, talking with people, uh, some of them were trying, some of the school teachers were trying to get out because they were under tremendous amount of pressure to, uh, which (laughs) happens everywhere, grade inflation was a problem and dumbing down the curriculum uh, to make it, you know, look more successful. Uh, but everybody got it, and so I don't want to, you know, take away from what really was a wonderful success that people were finally allowed to have it, and also the health care, um, and at least rationed food, and uh, so there was a certain base level of uh, support for everybody, and, it, you know, Brigade built housing, which was terribly horrible, but it, it gave people housing, and it gave people a sense that they were building a new state. So all of those things are great. But then when you don't have any medicine anymore uh, coming in and the wonderfully trained doctors are there with nothing to work with, then you certainly wouldn't want to be in one of the hospitals. And I remember people coming in from the Bahamas uh, with their own anesthesia and supplies to have wonderful surgeries done in Cuba, but they had to provide a lot of what they needed um, so Bahamian you know, uh, uh, citizens would come to Cuba with their own medical supplies and basically well, just so that they could use the doctors? I don't know that doctors? they were Bahamians, but right. they were coming on planes from the Bahamas and um, talking about what they were going to get done in Cuba. So it became a place where wonderful medical care was available, but not the supplies for it. Uh, t- tell us also about the brigade housing, because I'm not sure that people understand that concept and oh. uh, whether or not that is... Uh, like I say, I haven't. Uh, I went there once, and that was almost 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, wh- I, is that is that process of building houses uh, or apartment complexes? Has that is that continued? Uh, is there uh, do we see abandoned projects uh, around? Yeah, or? I don't see it happening anymore. But the remnants of them are still everywhere, including in sort of relocated villages that the state tried to move people to the countryside during this special period exactly for the reasons that there were overcrowding in the city and it was hard to get food in and that sort of thing. And so some of the places are are just sort of uh, in unusual spots out in the countryside. A a very successful or a pretty successful one was a place called Las Terrazas, the terraces, that was um, a, a reforestation project the state started out in the countryside, moved everybody out there, created some housing for them, 
they planted trees which are now beautifully big. Uh, there's a beautiful lake there, and it's now become sort of an eco tourist spot uh, to go to uh, with even one little lodge to stay in. The people are generations there, some artists, but mostly people who worked in agriculture and reforestation. Um, but one of the people I met there had been a French teacher in the capital, uh, didn't really want to move there, but there was no other way at that point. Um, and now she's one of the people that helps tourists uh, see the place and answers questions. They're still on their ration cards out there, but there's a school and there's a, it's really a pretty place to be. It may not have been a choice, but it's pretty now. And I, and I don't know that people understand. I mean, we should say that these brigade housing, basically you build your own apartment complex. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. And so in the city, uh, it's not so pretty, those places. And they are, uh, you know, what you might consider brutalist architecture of the Soviet era, just the simplest forms of blocks of housing. But people not trained in any sort of way would uh, have to work on building these, not have to. They were encouraged, and it was a civic uh, effort. Um, and they would build a lot of cheap housing into which people could go. And so the older colonial houses that were in this city, the heart of the city that had been occupied by everybody who was homeless, um, many, many families worth, were often moved back into these brand new um, Soviet built housing uh, by the people under the Soviet regime, I should say. And then the beautiful old colonial homes around the squares that you probably saw became artists' um, workshops and places that tourists could go and buy uh, approved art and that sort of thing. And um, so I, you saw a big transformation in the early 90s when UNESCO went in and, and saved some of the old buildings, designated Havana a, a World Heritage Site and that sort of thing. But um, so the brutalist housing was better than no housing, and uh, it still survives and doesn't look as bad in the countryside. But, um, you know, it wasn't as if anybody got any possibility to design their own style of living. So what do you anticipate happening now? I mean, uh, is it a, uh, you know, assuming that these uh, small sort of like uh, foot in the door, if you will, uh, greater sort of connections, a, a recognition of, uh, a formal uh, recognition of the existence of each other, essentially. Um, well, what do you anticipate happening uh, in the years to come, uh, assuming that this is slowly begins to crumble the embargo? Well, um, you know, I hope that it'll just be more open for everybody. It's already gotten so much better for families to go back and forth, and so you may have seen also in Miami uh, the people that made the trips to visit all their relatives in the U.S. would go back to Cuba loaded with everything from, you know, baby dolls to televisions to old auto parts wrapped in that blue plastic uh, film that they have to use to keep everything together on the planes. Um, and all of those remittances of material goods and money have really helped improve the situation a lot. But if you opened it totally, um, I think that would actually create more possibilities for small businesses and, uh, you know, even farming and, and other sorts of things that take fuel and take machinery and that sort of thing that could be possibly more independent. There's some independent agriculture allowed now as well as little... Um, restaurants and little bed and breakfast kinds of places. So the more of that that happens, I think it's easier for everybody. And I think one of the biggest needs is access to information. Uh, I, I know that we dis the U.S. distributed a lot of free telephones, little cell phones everywhere. That's one of the big things relatives want to send their, their families. Um, but Internet is tightly controlled, so information flows are, are difficult. I, I want to see all of that happen uh, and actually, we have historic relations with Cuba that go forever. And uh, the Cubans always liked Americans as individuals, actually. They don't like our system and that created suffering for them. And they don't understand exactly how much of it was not created by the U.S., but all of our silly misadventures of exploding cigars and that sort of thing in Operation Mongoose just allowed the government to keep us as the, the main problem. And I think if we remove ourselves from that, you know, image 
everybody did like Americans. I actually had a friend tell me they didn't like the Soviets so much because they couldn't dance and their food was bad and they stuck to themselves, whereas they saw Americans as sort of, uh, you know, more like them than Soviets were. And so even in the special period, I would hear Michael Jackson blasting out of places and people play baseball and discuss baseball on the squares. And so there's really this cultural affinity that we should be able to restore. All right. And I should just uh, tell people, too, that um, uh, Operation Mongoose was um, another one of our plans to assassinate uh, or Castro, or I guess another... Uh, which involved the uh, g- trying to gift him a cigar that was uh, supposed to blow up. Yeah, um, yeah I, I grew up in Miami, and so you would see all the boats coming up the canals to the uh, up the very nice houses where these things were run out of on the canal systems in in Miami, and uh, you would see in the little restaurants in Calle Ocho the guys coming in from having practiced in the Everglades to join some of the expeditions, and they'd be you know, posters all over those restaurants as well. So that's the older guard, you know, that have pretty well dominated for a long time. But the younger generation doesn't want to want to continue that. Jane Landers, uh, thanks so much for your time today. I enjoyed uh, it. Professor at Vanderbilt, uh, appreciate your, 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 your speaking to us on this. Thank you, Sam. Okay.